John and I were um, discussing what is it we're going to look at over the next um, probably couple months in terms of our preaching stuff. And um, this is really a season of transition for the church. It's a chance to, to reimagine what is Harbor. Um, if we're going to change our building, what do we want to be like in whatever space we land? Do we want to be exactly the same? Do we want to be different? And uh, to get some clarity around our purpose and who we are, because if we're not this building, then we're obviously something. Um, and so we decided to look at the Book of Acts together. And so um, that's what we're going to be doing for the next uh, little bit. And um, and um, normally when you preach on Acts, uh, not that I've normally preached on Acts, I've done it I think twice in my career now, but um, when you look at what churches do, they generally jump directly to chapter 2 and they do Pentecost, because that's kind of the birthday of the church. It's when the church uh, kind of exploded out. And... Um, and I sat around and I read the book of Acts and I was like, why do we jump directly to two? And, and chapter one got my attention. And so we're going to look at chapter one, verses one through 11 today. Um, I don't think I've ever seen a sermon preached on that passage, but today there will be one. So um, let's pray. God, thank you. Um, thanks for this church. Thanks for your word. Thanks for your presence with us. Thanks that we are so much more than uh, just four walls and a ceiling and a floor. Uh, but really, we're your community and a community that you are working in the midst of. Uh, we love you. We put ourselves into your hands, especially in these next few moments as we listen to you. Amen. All right. So um, we're kind of talking about uh, revisioning and, and um, re-understanding what the church is and, and I kind of called the sermon going back to your roots because that's really what I want to do. I want to get us uh, we're, we don't need to reinvent ourselves to evolve to become something new. The church is a beautiful and incredible thing that God created. What um, we need to do is to get back to who we truly are in Christ. Um, in the book Onward, uh, Howard Schultz writes about Starbucks and how Starbucks kind of evolved and he talks about how he had retired as the CEO and sort of took his hand off the wheel. And at that point, Starbucks had gone from this little tiny coffee roaster that decided to melt coffee roasting to the Italian experience of being in a coffee house, way before anybody else had really done a lot of that. And, and it exploded. I mean, it just, people loved being in the coffee house the environment. And Starbucks became an institution all its own. And with that came lots of partnerships. They had access to nearly everybody. So um, people were like, hey, how about selling DVDs there? You could do all sorts of things. You could sell this, you could sell that. And Howard Schultz kind of taking his uh, hands off the wheel and people uh, that were in charge go, yeah, let's, let's work on these partnerships. Let's become a DVD shop and a coffee shop. And as they did this, it got further and further. They um, began to be diluted. They didn't, they, they diffused the coffee experience. You didn't know what you were going to get when you went into Starbucks because it was sort of a shop and sort of a coffee shop and sort of a this and sort of a that. And um, Starbucks, for the very first time, began to take losses instead of growths. Um, and so he came out of uh, his retirement and his plan for revitalizing Starbucks was, let's get back to what we are about. And I think that is the season for Harbor Church, and I think it's a great season for our lives. What does it mean for us to be followers of Jesus Christ? What what does that look like? What if we actually strip away some of the other stuff that we lump onto that and just look at what is the pure concentrate, the essence of following Jesus? Um, and then Acts is a beautiful, beautiful place to do that. And so um, that is what we're going to do. That's uh, Acts in the Bible is the story uh, once um, Jesus had ascended into heaven, what did the church do at its very earliest form? And um, in it is the concentrate we're looking for. So let me read this passage we're looking at for us. <clears throat> All right. All right. In my thorn, this is uh, chapter 1, 1 through 11. In my former book, Theophilus, I wrote about all that Jesus began to do and teach until the day he was taken up to heaven. 
And after giving instruction through the Holy Spirit to the apostles he had chosen, after his suffering, he showed himself to these men and gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of God. And on one occasion, while he was eating with them, he gave them this command, Don't leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised, which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. And so when they met together, they asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? And he said to them, It is not for you to know the times or the dates that the Father has set by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea, and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. And after he said this, he was taken up before their very eyes, and a cloud hid him from their sight. And they were looking intently up into the sky as he was going, and then suddenly two men dressed in white stood beside them, said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand here looking into the sky? That same Jesus who has been taken from you into heaven will come back in the same way you have seen him go into heaven. And that is the beginning of Acts. Um, it began with, in my former book, Theophilus. Um, it's an important note. Uh, Luke is actually the story of Jesus' ministry in a very nice uh, catalog form. Um, if you were to describe the different Gospels, you have John, the great poet, who does amazing things with imagery. You have Matthew, who is looking at the Old Testament and saying, here's how Jesus fulfilled that. You have Mark, who's sort of your action-adventure movie, uh, which goes through all the things that Jesus did in rapid-fire thing, and it's the shortest of the Gospels. And then you have Luke, and Luke is the documentary. Luke is the guy who said, I'm going to orderly collect all these things and put them in a nice orderly fashion so that you can see them. And um, and then as soon as Luke, the book, got finished, he said, I need to write the second book, which is Acts. And it's it's a two-part section, thereby making the book of John the worst placed book in the entire Bible because it breaks it up. It's like a two-part movie, except uh, we stop and then we read John in the middle. Um, so Acts is actually a continuation of Luke. And that first one um, said, this is, my former book was the book of all that Jesus began to do and teach. And as you go through Acts, what you're going to find is that the same stuff that Jesus did and taught was the exact same stuff that the church now began to do and teach by the power of the Holy Spirit. That's a continuation. Um, it makes verse 1, actually, where it says that uh, what Jesus began to do and teach is um, our purpose statement. It's almost uh, the most important line in the entire book of Acts. And it just gets run over as part of the entry. Um, so, who is the church? What is the church? Um, the church is the group of people who began to do and teach the same things that Jesus had been doing and teaching, except by the power of the Holy Spirit that he put inside of them. Um, that is our purpose, and um, it's amazing how many other things the church can be about besides that. Um, it's it's uh, it's a crazy thing. We um, our purpose in life, even our purpose as followers of Jesus, there are lots of purposes you can have. It's to be happy. Uh, that's a valid purpose that lots of people pursue. Um, to make lots of money. That's my brother's purpose. He's decided for his life. And I, I just want to make a lot of money and then I'll be successful. Being successful could be a purpose. Um, followers of Jesus have a purpose. And it's to follow Jesus and to say and do the things that Jesus did. Um, we're disciples. That's the word that's used frequently. What is a disciple? My niece was asking me this. She's up visiting hasn't grown up in the church except for the occasional Sunday on Easter. Um, and I gave her a Bible and she's been reading uh, the book of Mark. And so she's like, all right. And so we have these conversations and I throw out a Christian term like disciple. And she goes, well, what? A disciple? What's a disciple? And I had to explain to her, disciples were the people who would find a teacher or a leader and then they would drop sort of their life or uh like they still did their fishing and they got by, but they decided, I'm not going to focus on my life anymore. I'm going to follow this person. And so they actually 
didn't just show up on a Sunday to hear Jesus. What they did was they walked around with him and they ate with him and they talked with him and they saw how he interacted. And then the next step in that process was for them to do likewise. They go, what Jesus does, I'm going to do. So if you praise that prayer, I'm going to start praying that prayer. That's what we do, disciples. So we follow Jesus. Um, and there's a there's a blessing in the uh, kind of traditional history of, of disciples that was, um, you made the dust um, of the one that you're following beyond you. And the picture is, you're following so closely that exactly what he's a part of is what you're a part of. Um, that is what the church is. We're the disciples of Jesus. We follow after him. And so we do and we say the things. And this has some implications. That means that um, the church is the church at its best when we act and when we talk and when we look like Jesus to the world. Um, we are the continuation. Um, we are not just a bunch of people who agree with the same beliefs and assertions that Jesus had. Um, and oftentimes when I read about like kind of issue-driven Christianity, it looks like that. Well, Jesus uh, kind of pointed towards this, and so I agree with him, and therefore I need to enforce that. But they don't look or act anything like Jesus in the process. And there is the problem. Um, the church is the church when it looks like Jesus. Um, a picture of it would be a, a mirror. So um, when you look in the mirror, you see your reflection. It isn't actually you in that mirror, but it looks just like you. In a nice clean mirror, actually looks <coughs> a spinning image of you so much so that you can do your hair and do whatever it is that you need to do in the morning. Um, my dad had a house in Mexico and we would go down to it, and usually it had been a couple months before we went down there. And there are sandstorms, and if you seal everything up, it sort of stayed clean, but as soon as you walk in, generally, it was a pit from just three months of being in a windblown, uh, sandy place. And the mirrors always were covered with this film. And when you looked in them, you sort of saw your reflection, and you sort of didn't. And the very first thing that happened was you took a rag and you wiped it down, and then it began to look like you. Um, our job in the church is to put ourselves um, as a community to support one another as we do it, is to put ourselves before Jesus and let the Holy Spirit do that kind of work in us. To mess with our lives and to get them to look just like Jesus is. And as we grow in our faith, as we spend time with the Lord, as we get to know him more, we go, oh, God needs to adjust this in me. And we can have celebrations where we say, man, I didn't used to be this way, but now when I look around, Jesus is sort of making me like him in this way. And uh, relationships come back together that weren't there before, and um, love begins to appear where it wasn't there before, and grace and forgiveness begin to appear where it wasn't there. Um, so another picture in um, one of Max Lucado's books about a silversmith, and when a silversmith is working with his um, silver, the, the raw stuff is not pretty at all, and uh, so they're they're refining it, and the the murkiness and the, the um, impurities would come to the surface, and they would scoop them out. And and as this process continues, the silversmith knows that the silver is getting there when he can begin to see a reflection in it, when it begins to be so clear, so clean, and so much its essence that he can see himself in it. And I think that is exactly what God is doing. Now, the excitement of this, um, in terms of the kingdom of God, is um, my niece is not looking for the Lord. She is not wanting to go to church. This is not where she's at. And somehow, um, because Jesus has begun to do some work in Christina and I, she keeps running into Jesus a little bit. Kind of a weird, tweaked version of him that looks like Christina and I. Uh, but there's some Jesus in there, too. We're in process. But um, what would God look like if he was an accountant? What would God look like uh, if he was a neighbor? What would God look like as a wife or as a homemaker or as a friend um, at Microsoft or at DocuSign? Or um, what does Jesus look like? Well, People get snuck up on by God and the fact that Jesus is in us and working in us. And then we can surprise them with what the kingdom of God is. There's a great book out there. If you ever get a chance to read it, it's called In His Steps. It's by um, 
uh, author by the name of Sheldon. And the story um, begins with a man who is out of work. And um, he comes to a pastor's house while the pastor's working on a sermon. And the pastor turns him away and goes, look, I'm really busy. I don't have time for you. And the guy leaves. And then the next morning, um, the guy comes into his church. And this is in a small town. And uh, the guy comes into his church. And um, kind of during the prayer and announcement time that we would have just had, he, he gets up and he says, uh, I just want to share what happened last night. I was in need. He showed up at the pastor's house and he wasn't willing to help me at all. And everybody, pastor, congregation, are struck to the heart at how something has gotten amiss and they're not looking like Jesus. And so at that moment, the pastor challenges the congregation and they all agree, we're going to do this. We're going to ask one question and it's going to be, what would Jesus do before we do each thing this week? What would Jesus do if you were in my shoes? What would Jesus do if he was in my place? And the rest of the book goes through each chapter being a different person's story and account. Who goes, well, what would Jesus do if he was in my place? And how this idea of being the people who continue the thing that Jesus began to do and say impacts their lives. Um, it's an incredibly simple thing, and it's also a big enough thing to challenge us for the rest of our lives. What would it look like to be more like Jesus? Um, another thing that uh, this passage brought out is um, it says you will be my witnesses um, it's another key word for this book of Acts 29 times in the book of Acts um, these followers of Jesus are described as witnesses um, what is a witness? well it's a court term I think we all know that Like you call a witness and they get up and then they state and what they're expected to state is Here's what I saw, and um, here's basically what has happened. That's about it. They're supposed to report on the event that they're being asked to report upon. And Jesus says, you know what? You're going to go and be my witnesses. You don't have to know all the answers. You don't have to um, have it all broken down. You don't have to have a degree or know everything. What you do have to know is... How have I worked in your life? And then you get to witness to that, to the folks around you. Hmm. Well, as your witness today, I will share with you that um, at one point in my life, I uh, would see my mom once every two months, and it was not a pleasant interaction. We did not get along well at all. Um, through a series of Jesus changing me and humbling me and making me um, be able to even apologize to my mom um, and to be able to appreciate my mom and to show love to her and her to show love to me. Um, we now live across the street from each other and see each other daily and um, really enjoy our relationship. And I can't um, give any credit to that except for what Jesus has done in me. I don't know all the theological answers. Um, you can ask them. My niece spent two hours asking them to me last night, and they were big questions, and I kind of uh, sort of threw out half answers sometimes, I felt. Um, but what I do know is that mom has repaired my part. Jesus has repaired my relationship with my mom. That's a very powerful thing in my life. Um, that's what a witness does. They testify. Um, and we testify not just by what we say, but by how we live and how we act how we treat people and that Jesus is doing something in us. So, we're the people who continue what Jesus did and said by the power of the Holy Spirit, and um, we're disciples. And I've already begun to touch on this, but how do we do that? Um, that's when we're going to get into Acts 2, but Jesus said, I, I need you guys before you go off and do this witnessing and um, wait here. Stay in Jerusalem. Just Hang out here and give me a minute because in a few days, actually it was about 10 days, you are going to be baptized in the Holy Spirit. And after they're baptized with the Holy Spirit, then they are sent out. And, G and Luke makes this big point about how Jesus um, didn't just die and, and rise again, but then he appeared to them and he was with them. Um, and through many convincing signs over a long period of days, he um, pointed out that he is alive and well. 
And it's not just to give evidence to the fact that the resurrection occurred. I think there's a point behind it. The point is, Jesus is alive and well and at work. He's alive and at work in your life. He's alive and at well and well and at work in my life. And he's alive and well at the work of Harvard. And that work is still continuing. So if Jesus is alive and well, still at work, sending his spirit to work in and through us, um, then we get to do something and we get to join in this process with him. And the disciples' response um, after Jesus ascended was to uh, look into the sky. And they were staring up into the sky going, okay, there was this cloud and Jesus and eventually it takes two angels to show up next to him and go, what are you guys doing? Why are you looking up at the sky? Um, and when the church isn't the church, when we're looking at whatever it is we're looking at or when we're being an institution or we're doing a bunch of stuff that doesn't look like Jesus, it's sort of like that. And sometimes God has to come along and go, what are you guys doing? Um, the church can either be a beautiful pipe through which the Holy Spirit can flow into the world, or we can be that mess of hair and lint and everything else that sort of just clogs up the pipe, and somehow Jesus has to work around us to get into the world. Um, my hope is that we can be the pipe, not the clog. Um, I don't want to get trained up with y'all. <laughs> And then I, I love the other disciples' response, which is, hey, well, now that now that this has all happened, are you going to finally, like, take care of business? We've been waiting for you for so long to restore the kingdom to Israel. Rome is here. They've taken over. Somebody needs to kick them out. We wanted you to do this the whole time, and then you went to the cross, and we thought all hope was lost, but now you're alive again. Can you do it now? <laughs> That's what we want you to do. Um... And Jesus' response is, you're worried about the end goal. You're worried about the kingdom of God finally being the ruling kingdom here. And um, Christians get worried about the end goals too. Our end goals can sometimes look different. I know there was an era where we really did try to figure out the end times and whether or not Russia was a part of that and everything else. But churches get wrapped up in all sorts of things. How are we going to continue ourselves? Um, can we get more people in our seats? What will be our overall budget? Those are not the things that we are to be focused on. That's not the essence of following Christ. Um, and Jesus says, you know what? Your job is not to watch for the eternity. You're not waiters. You're not to sit and wait for me to do something. Instead, go and be my witnesses. Ultimately, um, we're not here to be an organization. We're here to be a bunch of people who accept the grace of God in our life for when we don't look like Jesus and we let Jesus begin to make his image more and more in us. And as we do that and as we join together to do stuff um, together that can help express Jesus to the world, then we are the church. Jesus is always the focus. The Spirit of God is always the means. And the Father's love, grace, and forgiveness to the world is always the goal. That's who we are. That's the church. And that's our lives. Um, it's not a Sunday event, because Sunday doesn't actually make all of that happen. It's a seven-day-a-week, 24-hour thing that God is up to, and we get to be a part of. Um, so then the YBH. Yeah, but how? How do we do it? Um, that's great theology, Chris. I'm, I'm really thankful that you took us through that first part of Acts. Um, but how do we actually do this? Um, and I kind of thought about that, and I, and I think the first thing is pretty simple, which is um, we have to get to know Christ. There's four accounts of his life. Um, we can share with each other kind of perspectives of what we're seeing in there. But as we get to know Christ better, um, we begin to look more like him. We get to figure out what image it is we're trying to um, step into. It's hard to be like him if we don't know him. It's time spent with him that we become like him. That, that happens in all of your relationships. Just the other day, Christina was telling me that uh, she grew up in a family that was defaulted on sarcasm. 
that's how they function. Um, and it's true. And, um, and I came from a family that was very sincere and kind of with the rule of, if you don't have something nice to say, you probably shouldn't say anything at all. It was kind of the rule I grew up with. So we got together and Christina would throw out these sarcastic comments and I'd go, oh, <laughs> I can't believe you would say something that mean. And I was so tender, and she and she was like, "Oh, this is not working." <laughs> and so she's teaching me by me spending time with her how to be sarcastic, <laughs> very slowly. But she's also become much more gentle and more loving and more caring, and and avoiding sarcasm in some ways. Um, her sister is this is very similar to her, but never uh, got married. And she is just incredibly sarcastic. And I have to remember to like put on my Teflon shield when I'm hanging out with her sister because because the sarcasm flows like it's pretty unbelievable. Um, and I don't say that to speak down on of her. I, I actually really think she's a wonderful person. But um, something about being around each other for Christine and I has made us a bit more like each other. And so when we are spending time with Jesus, we become a bit more like him. The second thing is what Jesus told the disciples to do, and that is to wait for the Spirit. It's amazing how taking 10 seconds at crucial moments in your life or in your day can allow God to work. When you want a knee-jerk reaction, when you want something, or when you feel under pressure, to just stop and say, Holy Spirit, have your way. Take a deep breath. Um, if we let the Spirit come into our lives and we don't have to be in control, um, amazing things can happen. Jesus says we love because he first loved us. When we let the Spirit take control, we find ourselves loving a bit more like him. And then I also uh, think another yeah, yeah, but how is, is this, there's something to that challenge of what would Jesus do if he were in my shoes? That question, what would Jesus do? How would Jesus react toward this person who has come at me or this situation that I am in the midst of that is clearly not ideal. And um, that's become a test. Um, as I um, hang out with friends who are atheists, this question begins to appear to me. And, and I, I, I know a lot, I studied a lot, and I want to blast back at them and they throw out their silly things about how God can't be real, and I go, no, but you just haven't researched it. Let me tell you all the stuff I know. And I want to like, it's kind of like a, you know, let me just shove that back down on you. And then I go, can I picture Jesus actually doing that? No. I picture Jesus not necessarily agreeing with them either, but going, you bring it out with me. Let me love on you for a while. And so instead of flashing back at, at a guy that I, um, used to go to Bible school with and is now an atheist. Um, and this weird moment where I go, what if we what if we come over for dinner instead? What if I built a partnership with him? What would it look like if I said, how would I welcome you into my home and we eat together? Because that felt more like something Jesus would do in that yeah. moment than telling him all the stuff that I thought was wrong about what he told me. And then my last one is, when in doubt, love like Jesus. He was the most incredibly accepting and loving person on the planet. Uh, what does it look like for us to absolutely, audaciously love people who we might not love otherwise? Can we be the one person in the office who loves that person that nobody else wants to love? Um, can we be a graceful presence to people who are really hard to be with? That might be a good start for us to do this bit of following Jesus together and seeing what God can do.